Feel free to ask questions. There will be an opportunity to ask questions, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair, assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah um, for the welcome from the Amir of Dawat al-Islam. I'm just going to explain what's going to happen next. Uh, uh, or more or less, I'll, I'll let you know how the day is. I don't know if people have seen the agenda for today. Um, so the first part of it, I'm going to have a conversation with Dr. Ali al -Banna. I'm going to ask him a series of questions, uh, take about 40, 45 minutes. And then you'll have an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. So do talk, jot down your questions. We won't take questions in the, in the middle. We'll leave the questions at the end. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, Dr. Hanil <coughs> Banna is going to give a talk on leaving a rewarding legacy. Uh, and then we're going to break for Salah uh, for around 1 o'clock. There's, there's, no, there's not going to be a break in between, uh, just because of the timing. So if you need to pop out, just be mindful of the cameras. Um, and then in the afternoon session, it's going to be similar with Professor Khurshid Ahmed. We're going to start at 2 o'clock. Um, Masood Bai, who's going to join us later on, will interview him. Again, from the floor, you'll have an opportunity to ask him any questions. And uh, then he'll give a talk on the power of patience throughout times. Um, and then we're going to uh, break for Maghrib and, and go home, wherever we come from. Is that okay? So if you give me 30 seconds, we're going to go and there's so many mics today. I wasn't ready for the mics, but we're just going to wrap up with the mics. Do I need, do, do I need this one? Yes. One, two, Bismillah. Hello. Bismillah. Yes, yes, this one. Is that loud enough? Is that okay? I'm yes. going on this one. So uh, this, this interview is being uh, aired live, or whatever the new terminology is. So today I'm here to interview Dr. Hani Albanna, uh, who has founded several charities, including the Humanitarian Forum, Islamic Relief, and the Muslim Charities Forum. He has visited over 60 of the world's poorest and most vulnerable countries on behalf of these organizations. Dr. Albanna originally trained in medicine both in Egypt and the UK. Amongst his many achievements, he has been awarded the Order of the British Empire, Empire OBE, the Ibn Khaldun Award for Excellence in Promoting Understanding Between Global Cultures and Faiths, UK, and the UK Muslim Hawa Lifetime Achievement Award. Doctor, welcome. Ah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I probably missed quite a lot from your biography, but it's what's available on the internet. 82 countries. 82 countries, yeah. That was the question later. Um, but anyway, 82 countries. So I'm sure other things will come up as well. Inshallah. So as a starting point, um, where were you born? Cairo, Egypt. Cairo, Egypt. Last century. Last century. So I'm one century old. OK. Then that means I'm in another century. Yes. But we're still in the same place. Yes, alhamdulillah. Um, what was life growing up in Egypt? At the time? Whatever you like to say, there's no right or wrong answers today. No, but at that time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you were young? At that time, it when was... When you were young any time? I always young. Okay. <laughs> I'm always young, and I can fight all of you collectively. If you can see me around, I can take you. Okay. No fighting today? No fighting, inshallah. Uh, it was uh, at that time in the 50s and 60s, it was very... Uh, culturally-oriented city, and Egypt was a culturally-oriented country at the time, value-based country, where still morality was the core uh, message 
of the community in Egypt and where the family values and uh, relations and Sayyidat al-Rahm was a cornerstone when we used to receive our relatives, our elders at home, entertain them, receive them, and look after them. Before the eruption of the communication and the social media, which divided the family into individuals, each one of them is sitting on a small tablet or a small device and separated from his brother or sister or mother or uncle. I know that. Yeah, I know that. Use it, but don't be used by it. I believe in it, but I don't want to be used by it. That's what the time. That's what we're doing. Why I regret now for the younger generation who have not seen this time. Even when I came here in the late 70s, there was still a lot of British value, family values. Sunday lunch and uh, nobody, uh, family time after five o'clock, all the shops are closed. Uh, one is day was half a day. Uh, Saturday, Sunday, they don't, you cannot hang your clothes outside. You see, even the pubs and the others close at 11 o'clock. And so on Sunday was a very holiday. This is before the commercialization yeah. of the shopping and all this sort of thing. It was a real British family values at the time when we, I observed it, when I came here about nearly 42 years ago, this month. Okay, 42 years ago. That this was, month. That was my next question. Anyway, yeah. Before we get to the next question, what about family? Which family? Your family. I have got two families. Two families. Tell us. How do one, you know that? One in Egypt, which is the bigger family, which is my, fa my late father, mother, and my old relatives, and my small family here, which is my wife and my children. And uh, you said 42 years ago you came to this country. This month. This month, okay. So what age were you were truly inspired by Islam? When I came here, I was uh, hunted by two young uh, nurses and sisters who were in a conference. I was doing my medical exam at that time and uh, I failed my medical exam and I, had, and I was in a, in a very bad situation. I was in Aberystwyth, and I read a small uh, piece of an, يعني, uh, about an event called uh, Christian uh, you know, Medical Fellowship Group in the University of Aberystwyth. And I went there, and two young female, uh, one is a nurse and one is a sister, one from Switzerland and one uh, from uh, Germany, they wanted to convert me. And uh, they started to talk about myself. Uh, they brought somebody, some Arabs from London to try to convince me about changing my religion in three, four days. And this is where I start to look back at Islam, which at that time I was looking at it as a traditional uh, Islam, but now I look at it as a value of Islam in this time. This was the time when actually I came back and I looked at uh, uh, my life as a Muslim uh, at that time. But eventually, you presumably, you passed medicine. I passed medicine in Cairo. Right, right. Yeah, and I was qualified from Al-Azhar University in 1976-77. Then I came here and I got my doctor of medicine, doctorate of medicine from Birmingham Medical School. And uh, I gave up medicine in 1994-1995. So why, why was that? But obviously you trained and practiced as a medic. Um, yes. And uh, was that not fulfilling enough job that you gave it up? Well, I was working since uh, 1979, late 78, between Scotland and UK, and Glasgow, in surgery, general surgery, ear, nose and throat surgery. Uh, registered in medical oncology. I came to do pathology in Birmingham, Birmingham Sharif, as you all know, Birmingham. <laughs> and uh, so what I was doing, uh, this autopsy on bodies, and then I got my job in Queen Elizabeth Hospital to do a research, where I started doing my research on the children who were born with no brain, with no spinal cord at the back, and the book is open, or with uh, a sack at the back, which called spina bifida and an encephaly. This was my research, and when I got my doctorate of medicine, 
At that time, uh, the famine in Africa happened 1983-84, and I started to uh, have a mind uh, shift from medicine into uh, humanitarian work. So why, why, why Islamic Relief when we started that? Uh, we started, and uh, this, is, this is something which for all the young people like yourself, the last one on the left, you, with the glasses, look like my glasses, huh? <laughs> What's your name? Hamza. Hamza, the master of all the martyrs. Uh, uh, at that time, I forgot what, uh, what you were talking about. So why Islamic Relief? Oh, at that, I, I, at that time, to be very honest, it was two or three things happened in 1982. One of them is the massacre of Sabra and Shatila of the Palestinian in uh, Beirut. And it was a big wake-up call for all of us, discovered by the French uh, news reporter. It was a big blow on our faces what happened to the Palestinian in Sabra and Shilakam. This was a big wake-up call for somebody like me who was actually deeply entrenched into the medical field. Uh, then, at the time, I was between, in a crossroad between setting the exam of the Royal College of Pathologists or distributing leaflets shop to shop, door to door, and street to street. I received these leaflets to talk about the massacres, and I started to forget about the exam. This was a Friday before the exam, which was Monday, and they went out in Dudley Road area and forget about reviewing my exam paper and all this. And I failed, alhamdulillah, I failed my, my degree. And then I carried on from 1983 when the famine in East Africa came. Eritrea and Tigray, and each one of you will remember the, 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 the era of Bob Geldof and Band Aid and Live Aid and all these sort of things. And you found that everyone in the country is responding to the famine effectively, but there's no Muslim voices. So that's how we started to think about having an organization to have an Islamic name and to let Europe and the West respect the action of the organization rather than looking at the name of the organization. So we now know that was an amazing journey, an amazing story. So what were you going to tell Hamza? Hamza, I will tell him, uh, if you can come here so people can see you. Me? Come on, Hamza, so people can see you. At that time, most of the people who started Islamic Relief, I started with them. How old are you? Yeah. No, I want him to... to, to oh, no, that's right. Come, come, come. I'm honored to be with you. Yeah, 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 okay, yes. Stand behind me yeah. to protect me <laughs> so nobody can attack me from the back. And at that time, most of the people in Mosley Road in Birmingham were at the age of Hamza. Jangir Malik, Anwar Khan, Sekandar Ali, and others. Either secondary school students or university students. This is how we made history by people at your age. Okay? How old are you? Huh? 17. That's 17. it. I said secondary school and university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of them now are either working in UN or other government offices and others and others and others without mentioning the names. But they started, we started together at the age of Han because I myself believe in somebody like Hamza more than believing in myself. And this, if you bank on the generation to come You'll be able to meet the generation to come at every doorsteps of those people. And this is how we started to look at the succession plans. If you don't have a succession plan in your organization, you are a dead meat organization regardless of how many followers you have. Because leaders like you or like others do not create followers. They create leaders. Readers, leaders do not follow the flow of others, but create the flow for others to follow. And Hamza should be one of them. And I am one of them to follow Hamza. Okay. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you, Mr. Inshallah. Hamza. May Allah bless you, Inshallah. So, when I was uh, researching your life, I was thinking across something interesting. The first donation to Islamic Relief was by your nine year old nephew, Hassan. Yes, one of my nephews, yeah. yeah. You gave 20 pence. That's right, yeah. I was curious what he's doing now. I was coming back from Sudan. I was nine years old. 
He was nine yeah, years old. Yeah. He was in the primary school. So he's about 44 now. He is, yes, 45. He's a professor in one of the universities in South Cairo. And at that time, I was coming from Sudan because uh, I was having a lot of photographs about the family in Africa. I had a transit in uh, Cairo for a week, and I started to talk to my family about uh, giving some money to the African, and I raised about 1,500 pounds from my family. This was the first donation, but 20, pen 20 pence of them was from this young man. SubhanAllah. Amazing. Amazing. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so from 20 pence to a multi-million pound charity. That's right, yeah. That's amazing. That's right. So... What's the question? I'm trying to think of a question. I can tell you. <laughs> I can give you the answer if you don't have the question. So, so <laughs> say for example, 35 years old now yeah. is that yes. Believe. yes. So did you envisage at the time that you're going to be... Do you no. know where it is now? No. So what was your thinking? What Nothing. was on your mind? Nothing. Nothing. Just work. And this for you, Hamza, don't be taken by the big speeches of so-called ulama or leaders who give you very hot-headed speeches, but at the end of the conference, nothing happened. What we were looking at it at that time, we did not have any office, we did not have employees, we did not have anything apart from the mission, the aim. The aim is to raise funds to help the people in Africa. And it was two individuals, Dr. Ihsan, and myself, who started in 1984, and we were going it from door to door, street to street, mosque to mosque, uh, city to city, and market to market, uh, to distribute leaflets. Only leaflets, which had been sometimes handwritten, or some, and actually while we were doing our doctor of, doctor of medicine and doctor of chemistry, I was doing his doctor of chemistry, and I was doing my doctorate of, of, of medicine, we were doing this job. It took us, you see, this, what you said, it's like uh, 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 any organization is an idea. It's like a seed. If you don't look very well after the seed and choose the fertile land to plant your seed into it, then, then find the right water to enable the seed to become a green vegetation. Then protect the vegetation from the animals and the, and the birds, then when it becomes a tree, fruitful tree, it will spread all over the place. So at that time, we have no idea what's going to happen next, apart from, we used to have a slogan, if I'm not sure if somebody was here in the, in the, in the 80s, help the Muslim refugees in Africa, and we're shaking up these uh, donation boxes. Uh, which is the plastic ones. You know the plastic the buckets, ones? Yeah. yeah, the buckets, yeah. And this actually, but no, no, if you tell me about the strategy, if you tell me about uh, <laughs> vision, forget it. That's later on. Hamza, you forget it. <laughs> act. Just do something. Act. And when you act, by the time you keep acting, 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 you develop your thinking and you protect your, because you will see the vegetation coming out from the seed and then you protect the tree. But at the end, you have to bring people with you to protect the tree with you. But all of you should be focusing on the tree, not on the one who planted the tree. Quite often in our uh, movements or Islamic movements, we forgot the tree, which is the aim and the cause. And we look only after the farmers who planted the tree. And this is fatal. And this is fatal. Islam is a seed, still a seed nurturing these big trees. And if we forget the trees of Islam and look at the scholar like yourself, like others, there will no, be, be, be no tree left for us. Keep looking at the farmyard, keep looking at the vegetation, keep looking at the seeds and invest in the fertile land so you'll be able to change your seed into forests. But this takes years. But it assumes, whenever I look at Islamic belief, they always mention yourself. Forget it. Forget it. This is wrong. Okay. So the this next is wrong. question, uh, you make it right for me. This is wrong. So, so the this next is, question. Uh, this is wrong. <laughs> Say yes. Okay, yes. But yeah, you, you have to answer me now. Huh? Then I'm this is wrong. ask you the next question. Okay. You can, the next question is, did you know, when I was looking at this thing, Northamptonshire County Council uh -huh. in schools, 
as part of their education syllabus, they mention your name. No. You probably don't know. I anyway, don't know. So, they, they have a I don't question. know what even the school. Is it school? Yes. Yeah, so, North Frontier County Council is like a local authority. Oh, yes. Who run all the schools. Yes. So, they have, as part of the syllabus, oh. a question on Islamic relief and Christian aid. Good to say Islamic relief, not Hanyal <laughs> No, then they say, they talk about you. No. So, afterwards, they introduce you to say you were the founder. And then they ask the children the question. Do you, what do you think, uh, can Islamic relief change the world? So that's the question they set the children. Mm. And they're year five and six, so 10, 11 year olds. And they work on that question. So if five, if nine year olds can answer that question, it should be easy for you. So do you think Islamic relief can change the world or is going to change the world? And instead of saying the question, this we have to rephrase it, can Islamic any organization produce change makers. Yeah. No organization on earth, no jama'at on earth, no political party on earth can change the whole world. This is fatal. If we believe that, we can do it as organization, as political party, as jama'at, we are dead. But actually your role is to create, to change somebody like Hamza and the other to make them real change maker. If we'll be able to build the critical mass. Unfortunately, we are failing to build and nurture a critical mass. We have got critical individuals, very talented individuals, and sometimes those individuals that we cannot manage. So kick them at the backside and we throw them out of our political party or jama'a because we are not able to uh, uh, keep those people. Your role as organization is to bring those critical individuals, the heavyweight individuals, the thinkers, to put them together and change them to a critical mass, here you'll be able to make the positive change that humanity needs. But don't talk about individuals and don't talk about one organization. Our role, our role, our role, our role, I keep saying it many times, is to create critical mass and to be able to manage the difficult young people instead of throwing them outside of our movement or our political party. So obviously, like it or not, we want to be inspired by you and your journey and what you have gone through. So what you say is correct, I agree. But at the same time, you, you, you've, got, you've got a story to tell. So hence, yep. we are here today. So what do you think or where do you wish Islamic Relief to be in another 15 years. When it, when it has its 50th anniversary, obviously we can't see the future, but now, we're trying to have aspirations. Well, yeah. Now I'm not talking about one organization, because I've been qualified and graduated from my school inside this organization to the sector. Now you can't rephrase your question and saying that what do you wish to see the sector doing? And that's what I'm doing in humanitarian work in the MTM Forum as well as in Muslim Charities Forum. We need to build a sector. Our organization lacks of good governance, organizations, yep. or most of our organizations. Let me be very, very modest and say most of our organization, not all the organization. Lack of good governance, lack of succession plans, succession plan to have successive leaders, generation to lead, Lack of identifying the great role of young people and women in their uh, top executive roles. And this accountability and this good governance is critical at the moment, at the time when we look at Islamophobia and xenophobia, which is only affecting Muslims. People are targeting us because actually some of little silly mistakes done by individuals. So my wish is to see organizations carry the name of Islam to be the best among the rest. As those eight or nine uh, uh, Islamic schools became the top or a part of the top 20 in the whole country. But building this school uh, system among the Islamic uh, uh, community took them about <coughs> 30 or 40 or 50 years to build them till become this way. This is what we need to do in 2050 or 2060 or 2070, we need to see every organization carrying the name of Islam 
to be the best in governance, in succession plan, in quality leadership, and on the impact on the community, for the community, and by the community. So, how, how, how do we achieve all that? We are achieving, but not enough. We are achieving. And there's a gap, still a gap, between uh, different generations in our community. And here we need to play the relay team philosophy, the game of the relay team. I give you the stick, you give the stick passing. to hope behind, and passing, passing on. And this is a succession plan. And the best succession plan is to be happening while you are in office, not when you leave or when, 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 when I am dead. When I leave and when I am dead, then I'm not going to train anybody. I'm not going to mentor anybody. But while I am there inside the organization, I have to take people by hand whether they are young men or the young female, to enable them and empower them and to correct them and to guide them and let them to lead. But after my death, there's no teacher. One or two other questions. Yes, sir. About yourself. You don't have to answer them. Why not? Because you, you say it's about everyone rather than yourself. I say, okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about yourself. Okay. Um, you have won so many awards, correct? Okay, carry on. <laughs> Which one are you most proud of? Uh, the community award, which is being with the poor. I don't care about many. That's why I'm not on the, on, on, on the national news for the last few years. I'm not on the British soil many times in, in for the last. I'm, I'm disappearing from the British radar over the last six or seven or eight years because I changed my mission. And my mission is that is to travel, to pass the knowledge to the people, especially in Africa, or in maybe the Indian subcontinent, which is Bangladesh, Pakistan, and the other. Because I found, because uh, we found, not myself, we found that actually a lot of knowledge is needed by this community, whether it's Bangladesh, or India, or Pakistan, or in African countries, or Latin America, and others, needed by us, we, consider it as basics, but for them it's something very important. So that's why you will never find me on the British radar anymore, because I'm not looking for any award, and I'm not, I'm you, unless you're still with us. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's why I rephrase your question again. Okay, so, but what about the OBE? So? Uh, did the Queen give it to you, or Prince Charles? The Queen herself. The queen. And are you able to share what she asked you? She didn't. It's just yeah. this, uh, you see, when people come and tell you, let me, let me tell you about the secrets. Yeah, yeah. I, I met, I met the, no, no, no. Yeah, I met the it. queen and she told me, you're the best man, the best one. This, this is fake. <laughs> it's only 20 or 30 seconds with the queen to shake hand. What you tell her? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And this is the end of the story. And if anyone comes to you and telling you the queen was talking about myself, tell him get lost. Or tell her get lost. <laughs> Seriously. She has no time because on this session, I got 40 or 50 people to stand next to her and just what she say, thank you. Give you the, I'll give you the, what they call it, the, 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 badge, or the badge, whatever. And that's it. No time for speech. She doesn't know. But actually, the thing I'm, I'm saying now, I have to, uh, to admit because this could make you happy. I decided, it was decided that I wear not a suit, not a trouser, not a jacket, but Shirwani. That's why my visit to Islamabad, is Islamabad or to Bindi, to choose the material and to choose the tailor to, uh, what do you call it, to make the shirwani for myself. Shirwani and trousers. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, for the marriage, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and my Arab brothers were very upset. You are Egyptian. Why you wear the shirwani? I told them, sorry, shut up. <laughs> you see, those people, who wears the Shirwani are the first people, in spite of my family, as I mentioned, was the first donors, the first people in the community here in UK to let this organization to stand its, on, on its own feet. That's why we have before the Queen to respect and honor and to credit the Asian com Muslim community who is winning the award tonight. So if you see my photograph with the Queen, you might not find the suit and tie and trouser, you might find a Shirwani. And Shirwani and Shirwani. And this was, this was, the, this was the dress which I'm, I was very proud to wear it because I was representing you. 
Great. That's why you're great. That's why you're great. So, when I, when I researched, um, I was rather Again, struck. stop researching. <laughs> That's the only way I'm going to ask you the question. Yeah, okay, no problem. Uh, I was rather struck by your leadership, your energy, your commitment, and your undefining quotes. And you said one earlier. So, what's one of your favorite quotes? I wasn't going to go for any easy questions today. Remind me. Favorite quotes. Uh, you mentioned this morning. Money one no, no, not the money one. The history. Oh, to make history, you have to leave history. To make history, you have to leave history. History behind. You see, and this was actually the quote on the car. To make history, you have to leave history behind. If you don't leave history, you don't make history. Okay, if you don't take anything today, at least take that quote. Is that deal? Yeah. This crowd is not happy. We'll, we'll, we'll roast we'll, them we'll out. We'll, 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 so we'll, uh, we'll roast you. Be careful. <laughs> when I stand up, you will be in a trouble. Is that right, Hamza? <laughs> so, obviously, you don't see yourself as a leader. No. Okay. My next, the next phrase of the question was, uh, and by the way, even if you don't see yourself as a leader, uh, what are the key ingredients of being a successful leader? Uh, first of all, you have to be with the people, not with your own group. Because if you are with your own group, you will be in a cocoon, in a ghetto. This number one. Be with the people and to be a people's man or people's woman. This number one. Number two, to be a good listener, not a good speaker. We speak a lot and we don't listen to others. Okay? And we think that we have the knowledge to give to others. But knowledge can come from a porter, from a cleaner, and from a professor, and from imam or a scholar. Good. Uh, if, if this was uh, mentioned as a hadith, which I'm not sure if it's hadith or not, if seek knowledge even if it's China, I'm not sure if it's hadith or not, but it's a good say. Okay? That means that keep seeking knowledge from every source of knowledge. Okay? Knowledge is something that we keep obtaining from any individual, from any knowledge, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, because we are here. I, 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 I give my credit to the people who taught me medicine here. Yeah. Okay, isn't it? When I got my doctorate of medicine, I got from, from UK, not from Cairo. When I got from my, my bachelor degree, I got from Cairo. So I'm, 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 I'm respecting the people who taught me in Egypt and respecting the people who taught me in, in UK. So seeking knowledge is very important. Having a belief or a faith, which is a crucial, cross-cutting. Believe in your Lord, believe in your community, believe in yourself, and believe that Allah will never leave you alone if you are with Him, not if you are with yourself. You see? If you are with yourself, Allah is good for you. Allah will give you the reward in this life, and in the life to come, He will sort you out, or He will sort me out. And this is some of the principles. Being, being people's man or people's woman, this is very crucial. When you are knighted or awarded, the award is not for you, it's for the community. Because you are standing on the community platform, not on your own platform. Okay. Community makes me, that's why I'm standing with the credibility of the community. And when I went to take, uh, when it was giving me the OBE, it was not given to Hani Al-Banna, it was given to Islamic Relief. So it's giving to the community who created the Islamic relief. This is where we need to look back at why I'm getting this award, why you are getting the award. Not because I'm a brilliant individual, not because I'm a, a very, very good speaker, but because the community loved. Yeah, yeah and we, we think you're brilliant as well. Anyway. No, 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 no. <laughs> Making you, not me. <laughs> so, Separation. I didn't, I didn't give you the question, did I? But you keep on answering my next question before Because I, I read your mind. <laughs> That's worrying. <laughs> Um, so it was about personal development, but I think you said that's very important for leaders or non-leaders to, to continue to learn. So the next question is not a trick question. Yeah? So I'm not saying you're an outsider, but say you're from the outside looking into Dalat islam this organization. Um, what's your perception? What do you see? From the meeting now? Generally. And from the what meeting now. No, I can, no, 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 no. I cannot judge an organization just by... Or what do you know about that? No, no, no. What, what, I can't I can judge what I'm seeing now. Because a visitor 
cannot be judgmental on a very long standing organization. Don't ever ask a traveler to give you a golden solution or a magic solution. No. He might drown you. So, but what can I see you now, today, in this meeting? Very few young female are with us, which does not give a good sign, okay? Very few young men, which actually, this is what I'm talking about, talking about succession plan. And this is where we might leave our young generation disenfranchised and they run away from us, okay? And this was actually a big challenge about actually handing and handling the leadership to the success in the succession plan to the future generation to come, okay? I was going to the other meeting by mistake, which is a young Muslim meeting of UK uh, IM. And I went there because I was hungry and they have to have breakfast, so them, where is the meeting? I said, what meeting? <laughs> well, who are you? Nobody knew you, nobody knew me, not a legend as they call it. And I decided to have breakfast. Uh, for, I know the kitchen, and I know where the jam and the butter and everything. And then they, 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 they asked me to speak. So I was speaking to the younger generation, to the future, to the current and the future. What we need to see in any organization, three generations, the kids, the youth, and the elder. And the kids has to learn from the youth, and the youth has to learn from the elder. And this is the challenge. We need to see our role of the woman, because the woman in Islam is Khadija, baby Khadija, radiallahu anha, is Lady Mary, alayhi salam, is uh, Asya, bint Muzahim, the mother, the foster mother of Musa, alayhi salam, and the wife of Pharaoh, is the hairdress, or the, the one who was combing the hair of, uh, of, of the daughter of Pharaoh, and if you know the story of her, is Fatima, is Aisha, this woman made history, yeah. made history, and I want you in any organization to have this cross-cutting and not to let anyone, any thug or any filthy individual to come and say Islam deprive women from having a, a say in an organization or in a movement or in uh, actually in political party. But I cannot judge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's fine. I, I cannot I, judge. I'm saying the same thing, so you're factually right. No. Um, no, no, I'm so, talking about what I see. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm seeing as well. We're in the same he's place. not asking difficult uh, questions. All easy <laughs> ones. <laughs> You're very good at answering them. Is it? So, yeah. <laughs> so, so obviously, you've answered my next question as well in terms of how the organization becomes fit for purpose um, in, in modern Britain. And that's women and young people being more involved. It's no, no, it's, it's not a, it's a representation of the community. The representation of the committee. Your community should actually uh, uh, should represent your organization should, re should represent the community. So I suppose uh, we speak very highly about uh, Islamic relief and uh, your and your team's contribution in terms of what they have achieved over time. And you did say earlier that obviously that wasn't written; it just happened. Um, and in terms of Dawood Islam being as an organization, and what would you think that we should be in 50 years time? What, what, what should people be talking about this organization? You should represent the community at large, not your own community. Because I am, you know, these uh, images you put on the screen, what you call it, digital? What, is the con what do you mean by digital? Dots, isn't it? What do you call it? Pixels. 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 Yes, pixels. How many pixels in a, in a photograph, in an image? It depends. How, millions. 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 You are representing the millions. If you represent the few of the million, you have one color, which will become boring later on. But if you are in a very multiracial society, multi-faith, multi, 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 you should, if we talk about uh, uh, East London, I was the strength or the, the most of the Bengali uh, community there. Yeah, it, from, it, from Brooklyn, yeah. Uh, Brooklyn in, in America? <laughs> Is it Brooklyn? No, Brick Lane, yeah, Brick Lane. Ah, Brick Lane, okay. <laughs> okay, if you look at this, it, you are surrounded by other communities. If we don't outreach to the others, you will just be living in a ghetto. And people will come and will tarnish what you are doing. Okay, and the, because they don't feel the impact, as the brother saying uh, earlier on, if you want to, if you want to make history, you have to leave history behind. That means 
the history will be left behind you by the greater community that you are serving. And this is the protection. If you want to protect me as an Egyptian community or as an Asian community, I have to be protected by the wider community who stand up and protect me in, 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 in my territories. So, so I suppose, I suppose this is a challenge. Yeah, yeah. This is a challenge. How do we do this? How, what methodology do we use to give da'wah in the West? You see, uh, da'wah is generation after generation after generation. And each generation will give the da'wah with the philosophy of the thinking of the age of their generation, not the age of my generation. Like if you get, uh, uh, and you can, can come forward, uh, yes, uh, Eunice, let him stand behind you now come to protect you. Come, come. And, uh, uh, and we've got a very young girl over there, we'll bring her up to us. Okay, okay. later on. So Eunice, how old are you? 16. 16, okay. And he has, with his age and knowledge to give da'wah. Now, if you want to give da'wah, what way and message to give da'wah to others? How? Uh, listening to the community. And what else? The, your time. What, what you use in your time? Social media? Oh, yeah, social media. Carry on, carry on. Ca so, talk to the people. Talk to no the people. No one knows about the social media, tell <laughs> so, uh, so Which ones? Uh, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Yeah, go on, go on, go on. Um, that's the ones he's using, most important ones. Yeah, that's what... My generation don't know how to use it. So I will never be able to reach this generation. So if I have those generation within my organization, they will enable me to pass the age and the gap and to fill the gap between my generation and their generation. This where, and they have to be really empowered, not just a stage managed photograph, not just a stage managed photograph. I'm saying it again. Yeah, yeah. Not just, because I know the game. <laughs> <laughs> Not just a stage managed fundraising photograph. So we have to get them because they know about the era, the philosophy of the thinking of the era of their time. Thank you, Thank Maulana you, Yunus. Thank you, Yunus. Excellent. Um, I was thinking you're talking about me, the stage managed media. No, yeah, no problem. But I brought them, I brought them here. Okay, so we're in a general election now. All right. And if you are running for prime minister. Me? Yeah. I will not. No, no, just imagine. No, I wouldn't. What would your manifesto be? If you're writing a manifesto, what would that look like? I think it is inclusivity and looking at every citizen in the country as equal individual. There's no uh, as equal individual. There's no better than well, there's no one better than others apart from the contribution to the community, to the country, to the uh, itself. So this inclusivity has to be there, but I have as a minority to prove that I am eligible and I can do the work. Okay. So my manifesto will be based on inclusivity and no division of the community and being looking after the social service of everybody and anybody. I don't think you'll get many votes. That's making a difference because I don't want to be prime minister. <laughs> because uh -huh. it's all about spending see, it, it, it was it about 30 years ago or more than that, somebody told me, why don't you stand to become an MP? I refused. You know why? Because MP will look at a territory of a small area in a constituency. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, when I was working with humanitarian organization, I traveled the whole world to spread the message globally. So global, for me, global. MP could be a glamour for somebody, but for me, it's not a glamour. Okay, so we'll change that subject. Okay, we've said, and you've said it as well, the youth are our future. Sorry? Our society. The young people, the young people are yeah. our, our future. Um, and in the West, they sometimes are preoccupied with social media. Yes, uh, but as as Jinis has said. Um, so, what me particular message do you have for young people, people like Hamza, Yunus, and others? It's not just a message; it's mentoring. If the young people will find me accommodating them, they'll come to me. If the young people will find me able to understand them, they will come to me. If the young people will trust me, they will open their hearts to me. But if they don't, they won't. 
And unfortunately, sometimes we build barriers and fortress between us and then people because we treat them top-down approach, not actually treat them like, you know how old Abdullah ibn Abbas, when you are sitting in the mosque in Medina and teaching, and some of the great scholars of Islam, uh, I mean, companions of the Prophet will listen to him at the age of 13 or 14. Habra Hazil Ummah, the greatest scholar of the, one of the greatest scholars of this Ummah, Abdullah ibn Abbas, was teaching at the age of 13 or 15 or 15 in Medina Mosque. And most of the companions of the Prophet were listening to him. Not only that, you know, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was a shepherd. He became muhaddith and he was a shepherd. And he looks very thin, and the other Sahaba were, were, were laughing at his legs when he was climbing a tree. And he became from a shepherd to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Okay. You look at this, and he was the first one to recite Quran in Mecca when he was beaten to death nearly by the non Muslim at that time. But he, from becoming a shepherd at the age of 19 or 18, he became one of the greatest muhaddith of the Ummah, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud the same. You know how Usama ibn Zayd became the great leader of the Muslim army who took the army after the death of the Prophet and in his army was Hazrat Umar and the rest of the companion of the Prophet at the age of 17, but at the age of 15 or 16, he was actually making other ghazwa, battlefield different. And this was the empowerment of the young people while the Prophet was there, while Hazrat Umar was there, while Hazrat Abu Bakr was there, empowerment where you are shadowing them, it's mentoring. It is not delivering speeches or shutting them up. Shut up. Shut up. I am, I am. I'm yeah. having fun. <laughs> no, I'm just joking with okay, you. Okay, that's all right. I, I like to be your joke, that's why I'm here. Um, so, yes, there's a lot of learning for us in terms of uh, giving young people responsibility. That and let them to do mistakes. Believe in them. Believe in them. And let them to do mistakes. Yeah, inshallah. And if they do mistakes, don't kick them out. So what about football? You didn't hear me. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I you didn't hear me. Next question. We'll okay. Football, huh? You know anything about football? Yes, what about football? Mo Salah. Mo Salah is Muhammad Salah, yes. Oh, Muhammad Salah, yes. For all of us, it's Mo Salah. Muhammad Salah, yeah. Um, he's a legend, isn't he? Okay. Is he a legend in Egypt? He got 27 million followers on his Twitter, is it right? Or 26? <laughs> Only no, all... me. no, I heard it. You know, I stopped watching football because sometimes it gets on my nerve and make me يعني, emotionally excited. I don't want to lose my life watching somebody. No, seriously. There are a lot of people die watching football, they have a heart attack or stroke. What, what for? And then some of us shout at the TV. Well, and, and, and break the television and scares. <laughs> Curse their wives or their mothers or their children, and what for? What, what, what I was uh, I developed for the last four or five years, stopping watching any football, I just see the highlights, whether it's good or bad for okay, me. So, the, the next bit of the question was So, are you surprised that someone like Muhammad Salah yeah. uh, is a Liverpool legend? Okay. And non Muslims, okay. Liverpool football fans, talk and have a song. What's the song, Salah? I want to be a Muslim or something. If it's good enough for Mo Salah, it's good enough for us. Something yes, like okay. that. Okay. Um, and every time he scores a goal, he does he prostrates. Sujud, yeah. Sujud. Um, yeah. A silent gesture. Sorry? Or a silent oh, yeah. gesture mm. of sending the message of Islam okay. to the world. Isn't that so powerful? That's good. But this reflects something else. Okay. How good I am in what I am doing. If you are just making sujood without having any value for the community, sujood is good for you only. But if you are helping your community, if you are very good, excellent in your profession, whether you are a politician or a medical doctor or a teacher or whatever, the people will follow your manner and your contribution to the community. What pe why people love Muhammad Salah? Because he scores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If Muhammad Salah keep making sujood without scoring, <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, you're laughing now, huh? No, but at least he's doing a good thing. Yeah, no, no. It's, first of all, what's your duty? What's your job description? I'm a doctor. I have to be the best. Then I can do my ibadah, and people will love me and love my ibadah. So if you do your duty to the community, then you do your ibadah in public or private. That's what we would. First, sometimes, brothers and sisters, we forgot what we are here for. 
We are here to serve through any profession that we are having. We are teachers, farmers, agriculturalists, scientists, uh, politicians, whatever. But we forgot this. And we said that, Islam, what's Islam? Islam is about your ma my mother. Islam is about how I deal and how I help the community. Islam is about how I'm shouting at my wife and beating her. Is that right? No, no, not me. I don't know about others. I'm talking about myself. <laughs> you see, I go outside and, and give speeches in the mosque and remind them. And when I go at home, I shout and curse my children, my, ma my, my, my mother or my wife or my sister, whatever it is. I tell you some story. And uh, once upon a time, a man, this is a true story mentioned by uh, Ratib al Nabulsi, he said that a man who has a, a, a daughter, uh, sorry, not, not a, a sister, in his house, and she's not married. And she was helping him and cleaning her because she had nowhere to go. And she has been abused by him as a brother, abused by his wife very badly, extremely badly. This is not Islam. No matter if you make Qiyam al layl doing whatever you call it. <laughs> no, I'm seriously. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm serious. Uh, you know what happened? One day she was sitting on the floor, and him and his wife, sitting on the sofa. And with his left leg, he kicked her, said, go and get me this thing. In a very miserable and humiliating way. But you know why? Because he knew that she cannot leave the house. And she is depending on him. She went and came back, brought what he wants. The second day or the same week, he had a car accident. When his the same leg was amputated. You see, this is Islam in action. You, you, you tell me that you are a good Muslim, not your length of the beard, not your size, not your height, not your speech, not your, even you are working in a qab or purga. No, it is about how we treat others. And, I've been, I've been sent to humanity for the fulfillment of the best manner of mankind. This is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi And Aisha Radiana talked about him as saying, Quran. His manner was Quran. And she said, he was Quran walking on earth. Islam is about the manner, Islam is about service. And even before he became a Muslim, when he was, Quran was revealed on him by Jibreel, Hazrat Jibreel alayhi salam, and he was coming to home, uh, the three, the three, the three, the three, because he was shocked to see the angel for the first time. You know what she told him? Allah will never let you at all, will let you down. Allah will never let you down because you are very good to your family, Salat al-Rahim, because you help the, 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 the people, because you support the needy, you empower the disempowered, and you are doing all this great work as a humanitarian and social worker before he became a prophet. This was the manner and this was the social response of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the community who were non-Muslim at that time. We're running out of time. Run, keep three, running. Three keep answers, running. Keep running. Keep running. Keep running. I answer what I want to answer. <laughs> you met so many people. Is yeah. there an individual person or story that has inspired you and continues to inspire you? The children. Right. The more you meet. Uh, you visited 82 countries. All right. Uh, is it a bullet point? Quick, quick fire question. Yeah. Uh, 82 countries, uh, which is your, which one was your favorite? Regarding working, regarding the disaster, whatever. Just, just because favorite is, 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 is too, is, is very fluid. Make it up Now, if, if I talk about Bosnia, it was the most, uh, the one who having a scar in my heart. Because of what we have seen of systematically raping more than 50,000 young girls. No, no, it's happened. Go back to the history. It's a problem that we don't read history. We don't, the history has been written while we were, were alive. And cross, cross in Bosnia, in Sarajevo, in Srebrenica, in Jibba, in Gorazda. And other, and this uh, this after 50 or 50,000 uh, young girls systematically, where the, where the government was giving the soldier tablets. They call it Viagra now. I don't know what they call it at that time. Tablets. So the man could, uh, could, could actually have sex five or six times a day with the young girl. And they used to release the young girl after becoming a pregnant. And five, she becoming five months or six months pregnant. So she had no chance to have uh, uh, abortion. 
And this uh, uh, rape sometimes happens in front of the husband or in front of the father, or in front of the family. As humiliation and dismantling the social fabric of the family of the Bosnia at the time. What I ask you to organize a trip on July next year, because this is the 25th anniversary of the massacre of Srebrenica, when the, when the, when the United Nations Peace Forces uh, uh, left uh, the area for the Serb to slaughter at least 11,000 uh, individuals, young men, actually. We found more than 9,000. Now, even last this year, when we were there in Srebrenica, that one of the remains, one of the bodies, its remain was found in six places. So you can imagine the organized killing. After killing the people, were cutting the body and throwing it in six different places to make it difficult for people to find, actually, the source of the, uh, the body itself. Visit it from 9 to 11 of July this year, and I'll meet you there. Okay. I'll meet you there, huh? It's announced, huh? Yeah, everyone hear that? Yes. Yes. 9 to 11 July. July, inshallah. inshallah. 2020. You 20... achieved a lot in life. I didn't. Okay, you didn't. So, yes, you said. if you had any regrets that you wanted to achieve something more, yes. what would that be? Uh, I had a dream, which did not become true now. <laughs> no, I'm seriously. Uh, this dream was 2004, when I found that most of the employees that we get from outside the organization are waste of time. They carry different values, different, 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 and actually, they could be professional in writing, good, but they are not the people that would like to uh, 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 depend on them. And at that time, uh, we were thinking about having something called future leaders. When we get the ex-school leavers, when we get the young graduate or the young employees of the organization to give them a master degree and three to five years training between the field, like Pakistan, Bangladesh, and uh, Africa, and the head office. In three to five years, we'll give them the uh, technique, the degree, and the field experience. I failed to do this, and if I live, I have to do it. That's why quite often when the young people invite me to go to them, I go and prefer not to sit down with in big offices. I'm resigning for most of the, 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 the chairmanship as I did it in Islamic Relief. Even I send my resignation, which not dated to MCF, you know MCF, Muslim Chats Forum, uh, two, two, three months ago, because khalas, my time is 12 years, somebody has to come, and they are looking for a new chair, alhamdulillah, because uh, I need to do something else. And something else, I'll be with Hamza or with Yunus or with these two young, come on, come on, come on, you, you both of you, come on. Come here, come here, come on. With these two young people, because I am very good in animal voices. Can you do animal voice with me? Well, I'll try. <laughs> okay. I always wanted to be a clown. Yeah, I am a clown. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not a legend, I'm, I'm a clown. Young people. Uh, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. It's famous. Yeah. Come on, come on. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> what, what shall I do with you? What's your name? Tell your name. So what's your name? Don't say it. <laughs> what's, what's your name? Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Won't you? What I want to do to be with those people. And what I want all of us to be is to look at the few, the best, the best investment and the highest reward is not on la in land, is not in, uh, in silver or gold or properties, in human resources. And she is the human resources and he is the human resources. This is investment, you never become a loser if you invest the money. Forget about your car. Forget about our property. Our property, any earthquake can destroy it, and you can see the flooding. The flooding in the Northwest, what happened to the people. And there, everything could have gone in a minute. But those people will stay forever, generation after generation after generation. What's her name? Zainab. Zainab, bismillah, is the daughter of the Prophet. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.
Okay, thank you. You can go and sit down. Okay, final question, and then we're going to open it up to the audience for any questions you may have. So you faced some negative criticism yes. in the media. Yes. How did you handle some of that? If you bog yourself down to keep responding, you go nowhere. You see, uh, they, they keep tarnishing you, calling you a name, uh, connecting you to a bad organization, or good organization, whatever it is, okay? Okay, fine, good for you. I have a mission, don't have the resources, keep delivering what you need to deliver. You see, are we better than Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Was he called a magician? Was he called a poet? Was he called uh, whatever? Are we better than uh, Hazrat Isa Alayhi Salam? Was we called very bad names. Are we better than Lady Mary Alayhi Salam when she was called? I, I, cannot, I cannot say what they were calling Lady Mary and Hazrat Isa Alayhi Salam. I can't. I can't. I can't even spell it out. But where is Isa? السلام, and the teaching of Isa and the icon of Mary and where is the teaching of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his mission and his mission. If you could have kept responding back to everybody, you could not have proceeds for us. So my advice to those clowns or those thugs who keep calling people names, be rest assured that I'm not going to listen to you. الجهلون, when the ignorant ones throwing them with dust throwing them with names, throwing them with filth, says, peace be upon you, I have no time for you. Excellent advice. Very cold water. Very cold. Questions? Cool. Open to the floor now. How am I going to do this? Someone, yes, sir. Someone will have to help me with the mics. Oh, the, me. There's two or three Do people at the back. And then I'll remember you first. <sighs> now, the, now you'll get the hard questions. Don't worry. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's good to see you in good health after a long time. And I'm remembering the memories of 1989, mm -hmm. Islamic Relief Games. Yes. Inshallah, and I was one of the organizers who came out. Yeah. And I cherish those memories. I just want to ask, the Islamic movement organizations, they created with new dreams. Yeah. UKIM had YMDK. Yeah. IFP had YMO. Mm. Dr. Islam had Dawson Youth Group. Mm. We all have failed in that area. Mm. In your view, what have we done wrong? Did you ask yourself why you failed? Uh, that's something I'm struggling with. No, you can't. <laughs> you see, because if the people who are living, who are young, you are young Muslim, isn't it? Yes. You're young Muslim. I know that. I know, I know you very well. If we fail to make ourselves accountable to the community will never discover our mistakes. And here I'm going to stand up because I've been sitting down for the whole morning. It's a time to be accountable. Accountable to ourselves, accountable to our community, accountable to Allah, and accountable to the young people. We failed those young people. We failed because we started to fight. And I'm telling you, because I have been seeing it. It was a fight between certain factions inside most of this organization. Who will take this, this young group, this group, this group, this group, this group, this group? This group? And we, instead of keeping in power, you see, Professor Khurshid is coming later on. The good thing he has done with the late uh, Ustaz Khurum Murad, they empowered the young people at that time, in 84. But we started to fight one another in 2002, 2003, 2004. Because instead of looking after the chicken who have the golden egg every day or every other day, we wanted to slaughter the chicken and to get the eggs and to kill the chicken and there was no eggs. Before you ask this question, let this organization to sit down. Said, what wrong we have done? at that time. Because the impact of the youth movement in the 80s and 90s was great. Actually, the impact of this little organization is minimum, unnegligible, unfortunately. But without accountability, that's why I started with saying about good governance. One of the most important pillars of the good governance is accountability. I tell you something about myself, and they made a, a talk about it. I was introduced in Sudan to high-level 
meeting, organization, Khartoum. I am so and so, uh, you know, all this introduction. I said, I'm not that man. I'm a man who one day, and this for all of you, us in this room, one day is because of my mistake, Islamic Leaf was going to close down in 1995. You know why? Because I was spending without accountability. Nobody was stopping me. To discover one day in 1995 that there was no much money inside the organization. This is wrong. I should have been sacked at that time. Okay? Now, but actually you managed to go back to look at the mistake and build a very strong finance and the accounting department to protect the organization from inside. If we are not going to be accountable, you know what, sometimes, brother, the board of trustees, you know what they say? We are accountable to God. I said, what? We're all accountable to God. But now, you are on this seat. You have to be accountable for every member of the organization. You have to be accountable to every member of the society, whether they are from your group or from another one. This is what we are not doing. This is what we are failing at. If we start doing that, we we'll build more. More questions coming. Yes, questions sir. Coming. So let's take more That's why I'm standing. Yes. Alaikum um, salam. The very valuable advice and, and you know, I see, uh, really benefiting. Good morning, inshallah. Um, I could see a, a fighting spirit in you, and I'm sure that fighting spirit in you have fought, you know, put no kind of poverty throughout the world. Um, what should we fight? Sorry, a good fight. <laughs> okay. And a, and a victorious fight. Of yeah. Um, you talk about the <coughs> people, um, and one example I would like to give is. When you go into a house, a new house, you need you know furnishing, you need a kitchen, you need utensils, you need the infrastructure to make that a home. Yes. And um, Britain is our home now. And we need to make Britain um, and have the infrastructure, you know, such as mosques, schools, and other foundations that we could empower young people. Now Islamic Relief um, and other charities um, in the in the UK, I think collectively we raise hundreds of millions of pounds. Of, you know, you know, which is a fantastic achievement of working class, many working class Muslims in this country. Is there a possibility where you could maybe champion um, a cause, an idea, or, or a strategy where if we could retain maybe 10, 15 percent of that two, three hundred million pound that we give as charity, 500 million pounds a year million, um, for retaining that within the UK and capacity building young people institution within the UK, I could see a very powerful, a very strong and vibrant Muslim community with that support, inshallah. Okay. Can champion that? We can. And we are champion. I'll sit down to make you sit down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Uh, yes, we can. Yes, we can. You want me to give you a blunt answer, which could be sometimes uh, uh, upsetting? In our humanitarian work, we are racist. Because we go after what happened in Asia, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in India, in others. And sometimes we are opportunist because we go where the money is. It is Syria now. It is, uh, what do you call it, uh, Yemen. It is uh, Gaza. But we have to tell the people who are running the organization you have to educate the donors about other issues. Most important, domestic program in the country become a necessity and a compelling necessity. Domestic program could be for the Muslims, as you said, or for the non-Muslims, as what we see the flooding affecting those elderly, actually in different parts of the country. This is becoming a compelling necessity, yani fard, 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 fard. For the younger generation, we have to tell them actually what you need to do to create a fund for selective high education, to get quality leaders from the brilliant young men and women in this country. Okay? This is where madrasa is good, but it's not good enough to produce a qualified uh, professor and others. I want madrasa to be done by the mosque, 
But I want the mosque also to ask the organization to get the best of the best and the cream of the cream to go to Cambridge, to go to Oxford, to go to Edinburgh, to go to other places to get the best degree and to become in the best position in the country. So the mosque will do the moral teaching and the technical education and the scientific education will make you the leader. It is a necessity, it is a necessity, it is a necessity and you have to do it, but you need to advocate. Without you people advocating for it, nobody will listen. Go to MCB and ask them to advocate. Go to MCF and ask them to advocate and go to every individual organization tell them we have right on you. We have right on you. We have right on you to get the cream of our people to be the best of the citizen in the country. Okay, Monjur at the back and then Sheikh at the front. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Questions about leadership. I think one of my close friends who passed away, uh, I think you know him, Nabil al -Azami. Of course, he's my, he was my mentor. Yes, he managed to complete his book while he was on the deathbed, basically. And he did a very good job in his leadership. I was, uh, it, I was privileged to have training with him. And he left a legacy in terms of training and creating leadership for young people and also the governance area. So what advice we can take from him for his legacy? And also, in, as you mentioned, that lead for young people and also the question of funding for the uh, the training of the young people. Collectively, what we can do, and because he left a legacy, his long legacy training and uh, developing leadership skills, all those trainings, how as an individual, because we, many of us, we're working at the different organizations, government, local government, local authority, high class, but we are like segregated, we're like adults in a different area, it's not connected. How can this be connected and we can create a flow of it so that we can, you know, that make a history to live in, or we can make a flow, transfer of transitions, everything. Okay. Thank you, boss. You know what I mentioned about quality of leadership is faith. If you believe in the community, you have to sacrifice for the community. You cannot come and tell me I'm very busy in government, in government job. Okay? You know what's your name, brother? Manzur. Huh? Manzur. Manzur. Which organization you represent? Okay. You, you know what? Don't come and talk to me about charity or volunteerism. Nowadays, your ummah and my ummah in a very bad situation. Volunteerism does not become a volunteerism nowadays. It becomes a duty. It becomes a farz. It becomes a 24-hour mission. So if you don't believe in following the footsteps of Nabil and sacrificing your time and your effort, his job will never be completed. Will never be completed. Wallahi am law wada al shamsa fi yamini wal qamara fi yasari ala an atruk hada din ma taraktahu. Oh Allah, when, when, uh, oh my uncle, the Prophet was telling his uncle, if Qurayshite people come and put the sun in my hand, in my right hand, and the moon in my left hand, to leave and forget this deen, I will never ever forget and forget, leave it. Unless Allah will make it to happen, and I fulfill and complete my mission. This is the iman of your mission. Brother, Manzoor, don't come and talk nice about Nabil. It is Nabil. What about you? What about me? What about us? Every one of us will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeing the book that he has written or the book that she has written and seeing the video which has been made from the birth to death, and would be ashamed of what we have been doing in private, no matter how the people were talking about us in public. And this is where we have to become accountable to ourselves. With this soul 
and give good tidings and glad news to the people who control their souls, their nafs. Qad aflaha man the victorious one, are the ones who are actually controlling the desire of their souls. Waqad khaba man dasa and those losers who will be driven by the desire of their souls. Then he talked about that after that in, this, in the coming verse. He took you from your soul to Thamud and Ad. Thamud and Ad were stronger than America and the West nowadays, but Allah destroyed them because they had, they had bad, evil souls. Bad and evil souls. Manzoor, talk about yourself, not about Nabil. Okay, next question. <laughs> Uh, we are living in a multicultural society, but we are a minority, we are not majority. My question is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran, Walan Tarza Ankal Yahudu, Walan Nasara, Hatta Tatabi Amil You know the meaning. Yeah, I know. My question is how could we, you know, make them happy or how could we in integrate to the British society? Okay. Jazakallah khair. Okay, well, never minority was a challenge. Minority never was a challenge. You know why? Because Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi started as a minority in Mecca. Him, Hazrat Khadija, Hazrat Ali, Hazrat Abu Bakr. The first three who embraced Islam was him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then who brought Islam to Medina was one man. His name was Mus'ab ibn Umayr. And then he brought Medina to the Prophet Sallallahu Then who brought Islam to Ghifar and the Aslam? Two big tribes were bandits, outlaws. One of the first ten people who embraced Islam in Mecca, his name was Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari came, he was one of the first ten people to embrace Islam. And they came from, a, from an outlaw and bandit tribes. After a few years, Prophet Sallallahu was sitting and, at, in Medina and said, uh, there's a big uh, dust, dust, and people coming like a big caravan. Said, Aqbil Abu Dhar, because he knew that Abu Dhar is coming. And Abu Dhar came after maybe 10 years or 12 years with two tribes, Ghifar and Aslam. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ghifar, Ghafar Allah, Allah, Ghifar, may Allah forgive them, and Aslam, Salam Allah. May Allah make peace and safety to Aslam because they were bandits. They were thugs. They were thieves. They were outlaws. But with the effort of one man, he managed to bring everybody. Don't undermine yourself and the quality of the iman that you have in your heart and the ability of you to change people. If you look at the community, we'll be able to build the community. If you look at the community, we'll be able to protect the community. If we, if we look at the community, we'll be able to save community. But if we look at ourselves, we do nothing. Apart from our glamouring and looking at the mirror. We don't look at the mirror. You will see one individual. Let the, let, let the community look at you. And this is where we come. Come to conclude what you said, Brother Abdul Muqit, is shine. Shine by what you act and you care and you share with the community. Don't, because this verse from the Quran, which I know it very well, it's for certain purposes. But the other, فَبِمَّ رَحْمَةٍ Another verse, فَبِمَّ رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيزَ الْقَلْبِ لَمْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلَهُ With the leniency, with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah make you lenient. If he was not merciful with you, you could not have become a lenient. Your leniency to everybody Everybody who has come around you. Let people to be attracted to you. Let you become the magnet of attraction to attract community around you, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims. Okay. We have a question at the back. Ibrahim, well, you've got a question. And then afterwards. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Louis Khan uh, from the Britain's first mosque in Liverpool. Um, Dr. Manna, this is the first time I've actually seen face to face and I've heard a lot about you. Um, absolute inspiring speaker and you have a great sense of humor. 
like the old chairman, you might know him, late Dr. Muhammad Akbaran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Liverpool. And you have a similar style of talk, which is, he was also as humorous as you were. He was my teacher. Apparently, <laughs> uh, was lost him in 2014, uh, at the age of 90. And he served all his life in the, in the Dawa work. Uh, my my uh, thing was, it takes, it takes a one great leader to change the nation. And it takes a great leader to change the wind from one direction to the other. And we have seen some in our, in, in our generations. Uh, I think at this moment in time, we do lack a such leader to come and to change the direction of the wind that we want to go to. And you are one of those, having listened to you today, and uh, it has been a pleasure. Is there any way, uh, with your experience, with your vision that I can see, can you lead and create a think tank that will train a group of Muslim leaders for tomorrow? I think you have the, um, you have the experience, you have the respect, you have the command, you have the vision to bring a think tank together who will possibly fund the people to become the leaders of tomorrow, who you will fund to put a right direction so that the young generation like Hamza and others like us, that we can follow in one direction. Rather than we have so many Islamic organizations protected here, there, all over the country, but there is no one global voice that the young people can follow. And we, trust me, I do manage the mosque in Liverpool. I do work with the community, everything you have said. And I don't think we can get the young people on our side, because we ourselves don't know what the vision is. We ourselves are not trained up the leaders for tomorrow to train the leaders for tomorrow. So I think you have done a great job with Islamic Relief and everything else. Uh, but if you could do something like that, and leave us something great. Okay. Energy, energy for a think tank. Okay. Okay. Let me give you a difficult question. Brother, uh, Hamza, what's his name? Uh, huh? Mu'min. Mu'min. Brother Mu'min. Let me give you something. Can we forget about our logo? Can we forget about our logo? Can we forget about the names of our organization? If we can, we can. If you can, we can. Because I don't want to bring a group of people who every one of them will tell them, I'm, sit down. I'll sit down for you, okay? Because <laughs> that's respect. I'm, I'm trying. Yeah. You see, you know, if we forget about our logo, about our name, and to build a new platform, actually for the committee, a December one. Number two, do we believe in young people? Do we? Can we empower our uh, young people and make them a decision maker of such an institution? Or even the current mosques and organizations that we are running? If we do that, we have the beginning of what we need. Money is not an issue. Never was the money was an issue because if we look at the, the last 56 years, there was no big mosques, very small houses, even a front room of some brothers in this city and this city and this city, or some sisters have been doing that work. If we start to look about how can we, for, how can we ignore and forget about ourselves and look at a greater community, we'll be able to build what you are doing, what you are trying to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ibrahim, would you have a question? Yes. Yes, stand Ibrahim. Up, young man, stand up. Let's see you. Right. So, if you did not do medicine, which career path would you have pursued instead? Sorry? If you did not do medicine, what career path would you have gone? Okay, can I stand up for him? Of course. But, no, you're not. You don't stand. stand. Up. No, 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 no. You stay. Sit down. <laughs> uh, my mother wanted me to become a doctor. I never wanted to become a doctor. It's, that's, if, that, that's to make you happy. But my mother wanted me to become a doctor, and I, made her, I became a doctor to make her happy. Then my mother wanted me to become a DD, which two doctors. Oh, two doctors. Two Ds, yani, to become a, a PhD. Or oh, the, PhD, yeah, yeah. So I became uh, another, I took another degree, to be, which is the doctorate of medicine. 
After that, in 1995, I told him, Mommy, said, what? I said, enough is enough, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna do my real the, the, this is my, 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 my photograph with, uh, with a doctorate, and now I need to resign from Islamic Relief and become whatever I want to be. I said, go on. And she was very happy, because I made her happy. Be sometimes the source of happiness to your parents, so they will be the source of success for yourself. Okay, last, last question. Last question from me. So, I think firstly, I just want to say Jazakallah for all your time and energy that you spent here. My question is very straightforward, but it's one that I've kind of been exposed to. So, what, one thing that I've kind of realized is all organizations keep on talking about uh, the young youth and stuff like that. But one thing that I have realized in the comment is that there's a big lack of the young generation. So, based on that, I've come to an understanding that there's clearly a barrier between the younger generation and the older generation. How do we, like what steps do we undertake to kind of close that barrier and build that relationship between the two or three generations? Uh, first of all, I have to ask myself, do I believe in younger generation? Number one, do I believe in them? Yes, I do. That means that my duty is to empower them, to help them, to take them by the hand. Younger generation come to the mosque till the age of 15, 16, because they are being forced by the parents to come to the mosque. But this again is their will. I know that. Because they find a different quality of teaching here and the, the facilities in the school. But they for, when they become grown up, they will never come to the mosque. Not all of them, some of them. Do we have the ability inside the mosque to welcome them? This is number two. Are we trained, actually, to accommodate and to listen and to respect the opinion, the stupid opinion of young boy and young girl? But would you not say that is where the issue is? Because we don't, there's no trust. That's what I'm saying. That's what the first thing is. Do I believe in them? If I do, I will do what make, what, what, everything necessarily to accommodate them inside the mosque. And they'll be running to come to this. You know why did we start the Islamic Leaf Games in 1989? Who said this at the beginning? You said that. Yeah, I scored a goal at that. Yeah. I played there. I played there. But you, you, you're defeated. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll give you the, la the last good comment about uh, Bradford Young Boys. In these games, sister, I want to speak? No, not, it's a brother, huh? Okay. You don't look like a Bengali. <laughs> anyway, uh, in this, we want, there's a gap. And everybody was mad about football. Okay? In one evening, in one evening, we used to host everybody to sleep in our office to save money and time and whatever it is. And they came to two or three teams sleeping in our office. And they were talking. It's one o'clock. Brother, please sleep. We're going to play tomorrow. I came after two o'clock. I switched the light off. I said, if you don't sleep, this is the challenge. Who was speak, or asking the question? Uh, you. If you don't sleep, and you don't wake up for Fajr, and you don't pray, you will never win. I challenged them. Okay? Because I knew what they are here for. At 6 o'clock next day, young people come and jump. Ha, 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 ha. I said, who are you? Because it was dark. I don't know who. He said, we won. I said, who are you? Congratulations. You told me what? You know, you came to us and forced <coughs> us to sleep and forced us to pray Fajr and they challenged us by saying, you will never win if you don't pray Fajr. We won under 16 and under 18. This left with them forever. This way you understand the philosophy of thinking of the young generation and they gave them the challenge. And they challenged them, but accommodate them. But... But, there's your voice. Accommodate them. There's your voice. Accommodate them. What's this voice? <laughs> Very weak. It is a voice. <laughs> okay, we are literally running out of time. It's not my turn, it's your turn. No, it's your turn. Your time. No, no, you, ha you have to shut me up. Because on my, on my next section is your, your talk. Um, but there's no talk, huh? <laughs> on, on a different topic. You know, this so, was my talk, by the way. So, uh, Finish. Asa, can we excuse your question or you want to do your question? What was your question? That's this. Um, 
something related to that. I mean, uh, you've talked a lot about young people, and um, I guess one of the main challenges is the balance between the young and the old. Yes. So how do you maintain, like, not offending the old while uh, accommodating the young? I am not. Okay, well, before you answer, let's take this one as well. Is it related or is it Okay, go ahead. You want some mic? Oh, blind me. Okay, then, become, then that's the last why, why one. Why do you want to become a blind? Blind me. It's why do you want to become a blind? Blind me. Yes, All that right. means. This that. English language. I'm Cockney. Anyway, <laughs> Masud Bhai. <laughs> Sheikh, sit down. Ustaz. Yeah, I'm not Ustaz. Great honor to be in your audience. Uh, I just wanted to read questions and comments about. Uh, I know you. <laughs> but the light behind you is, is, pre is yeah, prevent. It's, it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. Masood. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Very good. Uh, I know everything you have said, alhamdulillah, you believe in it. And that's why I believe it has made a difference. But I still want to elicit a little bit more uh, from you, uh, especially in terms of your advice regarding trusting the youth, empowering the youth, giving them <coughs> responsibilities. And in relation to that, I just want to share one experience that I think it was in 1989 that I was one of the volunteers sent to Bangladesh as a, as a delegation on behalf of uh, Islamic Relief and it was a combined effort with Muslim Aid as well to go and distribute funds to the flood victims and I was... 1991. 1991, there you go. Uh, and I was, He's getting old, that's why he forgets <laughs> things. I was much younger than now, of course. Uh, some With more uh, hair, huh? <laughs> and uh, that gave me a tremendous boost. Mm. What I could not at that time believe is that these elders trusted someone so young with so much money, you know, thousands of pounds to go and distribute to different people all around the country. I was there for a whole month. Uh, so that trust that you and others had put on someone like me gave me the courage and confidence and conviction to carry on doing much more, alhamdulillah. Why is it that isn't happening much more through all our organizations who also see the benefit, but we are reserved? So what advice do you have for us? Okay. Quick answer, Chef. Quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quick answer uh, for... Uh, very difficult questions. The first one, I am as an elder. My duty is to become a brother to my son, to become a brother to my daughter. Khawi abna'akum, be brother to your sons and their daughter. Treat them as brothers. And when I'm in an organization, I look at the community as all the children are my children. And I want them to become my brothers and my sisters. And I want to stand next to them to help them. This is for me as an elder, okay? If I have this philosophy of thinking at the back of my mind, I'll be able to accommodate as many young people as we can. But the younger generation also has to respect me. I'm not from their planet. I'm not from their age. I'm not from their generation. I think differently. They don't make jokes about me. And this were the gaps. This respect from the younger to the elder and lack of trust from the elder to the younger. If we sit down and have like a pilot study in one of the organization and do it, the young people has to be encouraged to work and not to be reprimanded badly if they do mistakes. Sometimes if one of the young people made mistakes, we kick them out and we call them names. You know what we do to them? We throw them to the hands of the devil. Because once they are outside the organization, Anybody will pick them up. And they have seen it. Very talented individuals, without mentioning the names, male and female, because they're outspoken, because they are leaders, because they want to be listened to, were not accommodated, and they went out wild against us, against you, against any other organization. This is where we can accommodate. As one I said at the very beginning, brother who's asked the question, the gap, actually, we have to understand the philosophy of thinking of the younger generation. We might need an advice from, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, not social workers, the other one. Uh, under counselor, teacher. Counselor, teachers, as well as psychiatrists who can come and tell us how can we treat the younger generation. 
For your question, Brother Mas'ud, just remind me about it. Some of our young people, <laughs> trusting right? young people and giving them responsibility. If I don't trust, I don't build. If I don't trust my wife, I will divorce her. Seriously. If my wife does not trust me, she will divorce me. She has the right to ask for divorce, isn't it? This kind of trust is, 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 trust is the building machine of the building of the society. If we don't have, it is like the cement who put all these bricks together. Without it, without the cement, we cannot actually let this wall to stand up. So trust is something we have to be taught by somebody how can we build trust. And trust will come by what? By our iman. Yani Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith, you see, if you find that your brother has done or sister has done 70 mistakes, give them as an excuse and forgive them and keep forgiving them. Even Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala said, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if you do not uh, uh, commit uh, mistakes and ask forgiveness, Allah will change you getting some people who can make mistakes and ask forgiveness. If it Allah is forgiving people, how about us who don't forgive people? And this will, will build the trust. And instead of cursing uh, Yunus or Hamza or Ibrahim or Zainab, okay, I said, oh, my daughter, while I'm reprimanding her, I do, I do this. Don't do it again, my daughter. Huh? <laughs> okay, this is the way that we need psychiatrists uh, to take us by the hand. It's not haram. We are not sick, but we need to be guided by the specialist. And we've got a lot of them in our society. They speak the language, they don't understand the community, and, 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 and. Thank you, Brother Masoud. Okay. Now I know you now. <laughs> <laughs> now you can see him properly. We are literally running out of time. We have run out and, of time. And <laughs> I know you've done your... Um, My speech, speech is not delivered. So you're going to do that. Yes? No, 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 you no, no finish. In 10 minutes. No, 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 finish. Yes, no, no, we're not finishing. We I still can't. got time. We still got time, but we only got 10 minutes. So quick announcements. So we, the, the Zohar Salah Jamaat at the mosque is at 1 o'clock. So we'll finish at 12.50. So we've got about 10 minutes. Yes? And everyone, after the prayers, you go to the canteen to have food, lunch, uh, and then we come back here at 2 o'clock sharp to no. start the next session. No. So... The, no, the, I, 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 can, I am in command now. You're always in well, command. Sit down. I'm just... I'm always. not going to give my speech. I'll leave it to you. If you want to finish now, finish. If you want to ask questions, because you will need to ask questions, you ask questions. My speech will be like a speech. But okay. your question is more valuable. So let's do it that way. Okay. So your topic was leaving a rewarding legacy. Does anyone have any questions on that? Sisters never spoke. You have to stand up and speak. Okay. Young man. So let's have one sister. Someone? Mike at the back. Let's, let's give it to one of the sisters first. And then... Uh, Can I just check if I have a question there. Anyone? Because I'm not going to deliver a speech. Sister's got the mic at the back. I'll be boring. Okay, if sister don't want to, sister don't want to speak. We're passing the mic to each other. Oh, okay, give it to Manzoor. Okay, let's sit down to get the last question. Because no point of giving a speech. Yes, uh, I think as part of your legacy, I would reiterate my early question was, could you leave, as part of your legacy, would you leave a thing tank of of creating Muslim leaders for tomorrow. Could you make that one of your agenda as part of your legacy? Right? I love to do it if we forget about our ego and our logo. Uh, I think through your leadership and your charismatic character, you will be able to change. I am with you. Like I said, it takes a great leader to change the wind of the direction of the wind to bring differences in people. Yeah, okay, right exactly. Right right Anyone else who hasn't asked a question? Oh, my, um, my question is based on, you must have gone through various challenges in your life. Uh, I've got two questions really. One is, what was the great, greatest challenge in your life? And the second part of the question is, if you were able to turn back time and went through life again, what would you do different? Okay. The easiest is the second one. I will not do anything different, but I'll use the technology. What I have done 35 years ago, I'll do it again, 
but using the technology of the time and the facilities in the community. One of the challenges which I had, it was 2007 when I was put in jail in, uh, in a country, which because the officer in the airport was mixing cars between me and somebody else. I saw this wrong, wrong, wrong. He did not listen to me. At that time, I was, we were planning to go to West Africa with 15, 16 people. You know what happened? When I went to jail, to my cell, it's the first time, inshallah, I, I have a good experience on, on this few hours uh, in jail. And if you can think what I was thinking about at that time. Anybody can I answer? I was in the jail, in jail, in my cell, locked in, wearing the pink pajama, okay? and having my toilet in front of me, which is like whatever they call it, and everything was out. Okay, what was I thinking about at that time? Anybody have thing? Yes? I think you are thinking about your work. Why are you heading to what the people are doing there? Think about my work, okay? Anything else? Anyone, anyone else? Yes? Allah, I love you. Come here, come here, come here. Come here, come here. Yusuf was Egyptian and he was, was actually imprisoned in Egypt, isn't it? Okay. You see how, how valuable is my camera? Okay. Thank you. What's your name? Zaki. Huh? Zaki. Zaki. Okay, come stand next to me. I'll be honored to stand next to you, Zaki. Anyone else apart from Yusuf? Yes? Could it be about the next meal? Next meal. <laughs> Thank you, boss. Ah, oh, yes, sister. Oh, alhamdulillah. So about what? In the grave. On my grave, my own. Thank you. Not yet. <laughs> yes? Felt like a criminal? Yes. What did I ask Allah to do for me? Help us. Helping us. Helping us. Okay. Any, any last one? Last chance? Forgive us. Forgive us. You know what I was thinking? One thing. I asked Allah to make me sleep. I didn't ask him for anything else. Because I want to make myself ready for the interrogation next morning. Oh Allah, please let me sleep. And I believe that I'm going to get out of the prison. And next day, the lawyer rang many times to the prison officers. The prison officer was very upset. How dare you are in this prison and the telephone rang two or three times in one hour. And this telephone never rang for the last two years. And who are you? To let me to walk this distance to come and knock at your cell. Get out, because I have to go out with some money to answer. Even answering the telephone, you have to put money into it. So I believe at that time that Allah will get me out and I got out. You know the reward was what? That say same day or the second day, I was giving the speech in the central mosque of the city of the country, of the capital of the country. And it was about Bilal. Thank you. Is there a question for you? Another question? I wanted to ask a question. Huh? Yeah, yeah, ah, ask me. Use the mic. Go on, say um, it. I wanted to ask, Islam promotes integration and getting to know each other, such as the verse in Surah Hujurat, where it says you should know each other from different nations and tribes and different colors. But how comes that in the modern age, in Islam, we segregate between different communities, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Arab, whatever, the different Shia, Sunni. Why is everyone separated and how can we get to know each other better and make friends with everyone? You want the frank answer? You want the blunt answer? Because you don't understand Islam. Because we actually, our Islam becomes our ghetto. Our Islam becomes our village. And this is not Islam. This is not the Islam who brought, Abu, 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 who brought Abu Bakr next to Bilal, the slave, next to Ammar, was actually a servant, next to Sumaya, was a servant, next to Salman Farisi, was a Persian, next to all those. You see, he, Prophet Sallallahu brought every individual in the community under one platform. They lived together, they loved one another, but these divisions is actually reflects the ignorance of the leadership. Because, you know, in the good old days, 
We used to pray in the one mosque because we don't have the resources. But when we have the resources now and each one of us say, my mosque, my mosque, my mosque, my mosque. Your mosque is not your mosque. It's Allah's house. Even the lead, even brother, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Zaki. Zaki. Even brother Zaki, the money come to your mosque. Suppose that my jama'ah is running this mosque. Okay? The money coming to the mosque as donation, not only from my jama'ah, it's from the community surrounding the mosque and benefiting from the mosque. If I am in charge, I will not allow your jama'ah to run the mosque or on, on, on what they call it, uh, solely, or what they call it, uh, on your own. On your own. But I will count the income coming from the community and the income coming from your jama'at. If your income from jama'at was 100%, you have the right to run the mosque uh, on your own. But if the income comes from the community, 70%, the community has to have a say in the mosque. Because they contribute, Thank brother Zaki. Thank you, boss. And I'm honored to be with you. And I want to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> the last Come. question from the sister. Last question, because we're, we're literally running out of time. You keep saying running out of time now. <laughs> That's why the time never runs out. Okay, sister. All right, bismillah, I'll go on. You know what? I have heard one of the sheikhs saying that even if you are not perfect in Islam and you have a small knowledge, teach it. Spread it. Because Prophet said, بَلِّغُوا عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً Convey on my authority even one verse. He did not say that you have to become a scholar before you convey the message. I might not have been Mr. Perfect in Islam, Mr. Scholar in Islam, or Mrs. Scholar in Islam, but I know this part which I would, out of my love, I will teach others what I have heard. So you don't have to be a great scholar to start teaching Islam and know that the knowledge you have does not belong to you. It belongs to the community. But what's your first question? Uh, what do you advise us to, uh, to become knowledgeable people and how to gain knowledge? How to gain knowledge. To gain knowledge. You gain knowledge from books. Okay? You gain knowledge from scholars. You gain knowledge from mixing with the community. If I claim that I have some knowledge, the contribution or the credit go to the community. Because the more you mix with the community and you make mistakes, the more you will learn from your mistakes. But don't give up. Don't give up because one, today you make mistakes, tomorrow you make achievement. So books, uh, scholars, and community. And take the knowledge from anyone in the community. Yes. Okay, is there another question? Sisters become excited. Okay, sisters. Oh. Basic qualities of a good leader. To be a good believer, to be modest, to be, have manner and the etiquette, to be a community driven, to be people's uh, uh, man or people's woman, to be uh, uh, show, showing humility and altruism and all this kind of character, to be patient and all this, what you call it, in actually in the leadership quality. And you could be one of them. What's your name? You stand up to people who can see our future leaders. What's your name? And what's your name, sister? Yeah. And this sister who asked the question. What's your name? Samah in Arabia? Maghribiya? Waka? She's from Morocco. <laughs> so, so you could be future leaders if you believe in yourself and if you can empower them, inshallah. inshallah. May Allah bless you. Wajazakumullah khair.